So, today, we'll be talking about Chapter 3, Section 2. It's titled The Agricultural South. You see, in the southern colonies, a predominantly agricultural society is developing uh, for several reasons that we'll be looking at today. The rural southern economy was characterized by agriculture because of the fertile soil due to the abundant rainfall coupled with the high humidity and long growing season farmers were able to grow an abundance of crops in the southern colonies this leads to specialization in cash crops such as tobacco cotton rice sugar etc these are crops that could be sold as a commodity for a great profit and farming was so lucrative in the southern colonies due to again the abundance of rainfall leading to long and deep rivers which allowed planters to ship their goods directly to markets this climate this geography is well suited to agriculture and uh, particularly I'm talking about the coastal areas of the Carolinas the Piedmont coastal areas where it is much flatter and much hotter you know today we're talking about highs in the mid 80s here in the mountains in Charlotte it's gonna be cook your eggs on the sidewalk type of temperatures and extremely hot and humid uh, so these humid hot areas with lots of rainfall uh, are exactly what is conducive to farming operations now because farming was so profitable in the south there was never a great abundance of investment in industry. The North invested in industry out of necessity. The South never had that necessity. However, I'm really talking about the one percenters here, the billionaires, the people who are investing great deals of capital into enterprises are investing in farming here in the South. Now, as you noticed in your notes, you are taking notes on the daily life of various groups of people. And your notes start with plantation owners, my least favorite people. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen Dave Chappelle. I love the one where he goes back in time to kill a plantation owner. He just does. You've got to watch it. Well, anyway, um, plantation owners are the one percenters of the South. They are the uh, wealthiest people because slaves cost a lot of money. We're talking about, in today's money, roughly $100,000 for an adult male slave. That's a lot of money. And that means that only the wealthiest plantation owners could even afford slaves. Now, there were plantations here in Henderson County. Uh, someone was telling me this morning that even this land that we are sitting on was once a plantation. However, I would argue that there were very few plantation owners here in the north and even throughout the southeastern United States. I mean, most people were small farmers. However, the life of a plantation owner consisted of supervising and managing activities required to keep the plantation going. They were the ultimate boss. They were also the ultimate owner of these slaves. Slaves are considered property, and so these people had absolute power over those under their service. The male plantation owner was also considered the de facto head of the family. This is a patriarchal type of culture. Uh, daily activities might include uh, banquets, parties, galas, various events that very wealthy people engage in, but also the management and operations of the plantation. During the Civil War, plantation owners were exempt from the draft because they were considered a vital part of the southern economies and managing their plantations exempted them from military service. So these very same people that were so influential in starting the Civil War never actually had to fight in it. Now, a little more about Southern society. In the 1700s, people were coming here in large numbers from all over the world. Of course, African slaves were coming in. We'll be talking about that in a moment. But a lot of you have German, Scots, or Scotch-Irish ethnic um, characteristics. Some of you have Irish tendencies. Some of you have Scottish tendencies. Uh, these various characteristics. I'm German. Uh, Wit is a German name. In fact, it's German for white. It's not all that creative. But anyway, my family came here from Germany um, actually around this time, sometime in the 1700s. There were Wits fighting the Revolutionary War. Uh, but we were small farmers, like most southern people. 
we barely grew enough to survive and that's what our, we engage in a number of trades, logging, mining, um, working for various companies, etc. But we were never these plantation owners. Not many southern people were really. Um, southern planters were a minority, but they're going to be the subject of a lot of our discussions because they were the most powerful people in the south. You know, wealth equals power was the same in the 1700s as it is today. Now, by the mid-1700s, this growth in export trade made the colonies extremely prosperous. And again, it's that agricultural trade which is going to make the South rather wealthy. And when I say rather wealthy, I'm talking about these Southern planters. Again, most Southerners were just making a living. Now, women. Women in the Southern colonies, uh, like the Northern colonies, had very few legal rights, uh, very little former schooling. In fact, um, the culture in relation to women was something that we now call the cult of domesticity. Now, this is not a term used at the time. This is one historians uh, use to talk about the uh, cultural expectations for women in um, the antebellum South. Antebellum means pre-Civil War. So what was life like for a woman then? Um, women were not encouraged to go to school. They were not encouraged to be in any types of leadership roles. In fact, life for a woman was to be one of submissiveness. Women were to fill domestic roles, cooking, cleaning, gardening in the house, doing chores around the home, raising children, and being obedient to their husbands. And this includes rich and poor women. This was a generally cultural phenomena that was being experienced in the United States and also around the world. Now on to indentured servants. As we've talked about, not many people were able to come over with very much wealth. In fact, most people who came to America came with the sponsorship of someone else. Someone paid for those individuals to move here. And in exchange, they would agree to work for four to seven years as indentured servants. In fact, almost half to even, in some cases, two-thirds of immigrants that were coming here to the New World were coming as indentured servants. However, often indentured servants were being treated like slaves. They were being treated terribly. And reports of the mistreatment of indentured servants were being spread uh, back to Europe. And rumors of how badly they were treated uh, actually led to a decrease in the number of indentured servants coming here. Their daily life consisted of work in the fields all day, every day, beaten if they didn't work hard enough. They could be treated as a slave. And then after seven years, they would be set free. Uh, and so their life was very much a struggle. But now the main topic of today is slavery, of course, since we're talking about the southern economy, which was so much based around this institution of slavery. Slaves are people who are considered the property of others. They have no rights as human beings. In fact, there was a Supreme Court case called Dred Scott versus Sanford where a slave um, was under debate. His owner died and he made no mention of this slave in his will and he died in a free state. And so some of this, uh, this slave had friends. And the abolitionist group picked up his case and lawyers argued that he should be set free since his owner died while they were in a free state. The Supreme Court ruled, and I quote, a slave is property and not a person under the law and has no rights as a human being. And the Supreme Court of the United States ruled in Dred Scott v. Sanford in 1856 that this man must be sold back into slavery and the proceeds divided up with the man's will. That was the legal understanding of slavery until the 13th Amendment was passed in 1865. So pretty extreme stuff. Um, slave, African slaves were being brought in in increasing numbers as the price of indentured servants were increasing because of the uh, fewer indentured servants that were coming over. Now, I have to ask myself, why? How could someone possibly justify the practice of owning another human being? And I've read many, many stories of the cruelty that plantation owners uh, treated their slaves with. Uh, many stories of the absolute power they exercised over their slaves. 
Uh, plantation owners would frequently rape their slaves. They would murder their slaves if they so desired. They have absolute power over these other human beings in what we call a free country. It's why when I talk about the American Revolution, I'm going to do so with a bit of tongue-in-cheek because this whole freedom that the Constitution provided was really only freedom for a portion of the population. It's so messed up, but how did people justify it? Well, in a moment, you're going to see a clip of a movie called 12 Years a Slave. It's an excellent movie. It won Best Picture. It was very, very well done. It's a true story of a man named Solomon Northrop who was captured and sold into slavery and lived in slavery for 12 years. Highly recommend it. It's very well done. And you're going to hear verses quoted from the Bible that these owners would use to justify the cruel way that they treated their slaves. And you see many white colonists had this sense of racial superiority, thinking that blacks were an inferior race and they would treat them however they wanted because they actually viewed Africans as less than human. It's so, again, barbaric. But the, um, the slave trade was based around a network called the Triangular Trade Network. And we've already talked about this in great length, but you see the uh, finished goods coming from Europe to the Americas and uh, raw materials coming from the Americas to both Africa and Europe. And so this is kind of the beginnings of what we call transatlantic trade or trade going across the Atlantic Ocean. But now I want to tell you about the Middle Passage, and I've got something that we're going to do in just a moment related to this. But the Middle Passage was the middle leg of the transatlantic trade, referring specifically to the voyage of these boats full of slaves coming over to the New World. So slavery in the South, daily life of the slave. Almost all slaves were bought and paid for to work in the plantations and the fields. Um, some would have an easier life in the big house, cooking and cleaning for their master. Some were able to work as artisans, meaning skilled laborers. Uh, exa example would be the story of Solomon Northrop, 12 Years a Slave. Highly recommend that movie. Um, he was a skilled carpenter. And he was also a musician. And so he was able to earn the favor of his master and live a more comfortable lifestyle. There are numerous interesting stories of these skilled slaves being hired out as contract labor, earning some degree of freedom. Uh, Frederick Douglass, for example, was also a skilled carpenter. He would sometimes be hired out to contract labor. And because of the freedom he was able to enjoy, he eventually decided to escape. And he traveled to New York, and he became friends with William Lloyd Garrison, a famous newspaper publisher, and the two started a newspaper together for the purposes of educating people about the evils of slavery and attempting to end that system. Traveled the country speaking and encouraging others to become involved in that movement. But most slaves, however, were forced to work all day every day they would be given Sundays off, and they were expected to go to church with their masters. They would sit in church on the other side. They weren't allowed to sit where the white people did. And they would be forced to hear sermons from ministers who would use verses in the Bible to justify the practice of slavery. If they were disobedient, they could be beaten. They could be killed. I've read cases of... There was a case in Chatsworth, Georgia, where a slave owner burned two of his slaves at the stake to make a point because they had stolen from him and used that money to try to escape. There are numerous cases of slaves raping, uh, uh, being raped, excuse me, uh, numerous cases of terrible things being done. Um, there's a story uh, about a young woman. Uh, it's, it's her story she told once she escaped. Uh, it's called Harriet Jacobs' Diary of a Slave Girl. Highly recommend this book. It's extremely good. Uh, it tells her story. It's not graphic, but uh, she did wind up having several children unwillingly with the owner. And um, eventually she escaped and lived in her grandmother's attic for seven years. True story. Until she was able to escape to New York. And then while there, she learned to read and write. And um, uh, a kind woman 
took her in and adopted her and eventually helped her get her children to New York as well. And she became a part of the abolitionist movement. Her story was instrumental in uh, changing a lot of hearts and minds. I think, um, you know, slavery is a, is a barbaric and terrible thing. And I think that goes without saying. But I think it's, it's interesting as a case study to see that people are not easily broken. And people retain elements of who they are even under the worst conditions. And slaves brought from Africa have many different cultures and languages. Africa is the largest landmass on the planet, over 200 spoken languages there, many different cultures and groups of people. And many of these cultures came over to America and blended uh, just through natural cultural blending with American culture. Um, slaves were able to preserve many aspects of their cultural heritage and the types of crafts and music and stories and dance. Uh, they were still able to have some leisure time and some sense of community. But often merchants and owners would split families. Uh, slaves would marry and have children and those children would be sold to other plantations. Um, and in many cases the slave community would take care of those children and see that they were taken care of and well fed. Slaves would also resist in many cases and rebel. There are numerous cases of slaves rebelling in very subtle ways. In some of these cases, destruction of property, they would destroy their tools. There were cases of slave strikes. Um, there were also numerous cases of escapes, uh, even under the threat of harsh, cruel punishment if they were caught. Um, and there were also even cases of slave uprisings. The most famous pre-revolutionary colonial slave uprising was the Stono Rebellion, where um, the slaves took over the plantation, killed the planter and his family, killed several other uh, slave owners uh, before the militia was actually able to defeat them in a pitched battle. And uh, as a result of this, colonists would often tighten their slave laws, be stricter towards their slaves, but there are numerous stories of slave uprisings. The, the clip of the middle passage I showed you is from the Amistad. That's a, a true story of a slave ship where the slaves rose up and took over the ship. The island of Jamaica was once a slave colony, but the slaves rose up, took over their masters, and became independent and are now the independent nation of Jamaica. Haiti was the same way. It was a French colony. Napoleon actually gave up his conquest of the New World and sold the Louisiana Purchase to Thomas Jefferson because... Haiti rose up and he, he eventually decided he had more important matters in Western Europe to tend to and trying to conquer uh, that part of the world and so he sold this area to raise funds for his wars in Western Europe. 